Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Mindful Soul podcast here, powered by Digital Bible Study. Happy Wednesday again. We're here with you. Um, I'm LaBeth Brewer, the host of the Mindful Soul podcast. And just to give a little background, I live in Canada um, right now. However, I am from Tennessee and Arkansas, where my husband um, preached at several congregations there. And then we ended up coming to Canada as missionaries, and that's what we're doing here on the East Coast. As far as my professional background, I'm a licensed professional counselor in the state of Arkansas. I don't practice in Arkansas, so I don't live there. However, on occasion, I do see um, people in the states um, for Christian counseling, some faith, faith-based faith stuff. So um, that's my introduction. I want to go ahead and introduce you to someone new as my co-host this week. I've got Mary Lauren Doggett with me. Thank you so much for spending time with me today, Mary Lauren. Can you tell our viewers about yourself? Yeah. Hey, um, like she said, I'm Mary Lauren. I am in Tennessee. Um, I am a family nurse practitioner um, by trade, I guess. And um, I now work in the field of hospice and palliative care. So um, thankfully, Labeth invited me to come on here and talk about that but um i'm married to clay and we have four kids um cole hannah ada and truett and we stay pretty busy with them um but it's a lot of fun i wouldn't change it for the world (laughs) so i'm happy to be here today right when you said you had four children i thought wow she's busy because uh palliative care is demanding yeah. <laughs> uh, and then four children is demanding. And if I'm not mistaken, we've just recently become friends on Facebook. And I think it's your husband who's in local politics. Is that right? State. Yes. He's our state representative for, yeah, he's the uh, District 70 state representative for Lawrence and Giles County. And we actually just picked up a portion of Lincoln County. So they re- they did redistrict in this time. So it's election season. It's an election year. So we're <laughs> kind of all over the place with that. Yep. Wow. Wow. So it's nice to have you here. Um, we know each other through Erica Greaves, and I'm so grateful that Erica kind of referred me to Mary Lauren. And I just kind of want to start off by saying that Mary Lauren has started, well, I don't know, you you collaborate with a doctor on this blog, right? Yeah. So Dr. Lip is actually um, my supervising physician in Tennessee. We don't have um, full practice authority for nurse practitioners yet. So Dr. Lip was actually a colleague of mine when I worked as a nurse in intensive care. And we eventually started working together again. um, And now she's my supervising physician in palliative care. And just a little bit of background on her. She um, is an amazing person and super talented in everything she does. And she was actually recently diagnosed with uh, stage four endometrial cancer. So she is um, actually now a palliative care patient. And so she has this really, really unique perspective um, with palliative medicine. And she's using her situation to kind of advocate for palliative care. And so she decided to start this blog and she asked me to be a contributor to it. So it's kind of her perspective as the physician with palliative care. And then she asked me to collaborate as the nurse practitioner um, and contribute that way. So it's been, we have, we just got started, so we don't have many posts yet, but um, it's been a really interesting experience um, and really, really beneficial, I think, because as you're going to see here in a little bit, palliative care is not really well known. It's usually mm-hmm. just jump, you know, bunched in with hospice. So it's yeah. been it's been fun kind of letting people know what it's about. Yeah, yeah. Welcome everybody. I don't know if I said that at the very beginning. So I see we've got I don't know if you can see the comments on the side, Mary Warren, sometimes. Mm-hmm. Let's you, see. It's the way that it's set up, like maybe Yeah, I can see them now. I had yeah. it on like the private chat thing, but yeah, I see them now. Mm-hmm. All right. So it's right now it's just um several people just saying hi. I did write in here the website address. I want to be sure that I wrote that right. Is that it's palliativedoctormd.com? Yes, that's right. Palliativedoctormd.com. That's right. And the reason that I wanted to put that in there is that so far you've contributed two posts, two articles. And the first one was really good. And then I just, I really loved the second one because it did inform me of palliative care and the difference between palliative care and hospice care. So I I encourage you guys to go check that out. 
the reason this is an important conversation is going to be made clear in this episode. As you guys know, over the Wednesdays, over many Wednesdays now, we have been talking about building better relationships. We have talked about how to do that in our congregations by um, bridging the gap between the younger and the older, which incidentally, we're going to have somebody coming on soon to talk specifically about bridging that generational gap. We've talked about how to build better relationships in our Bible classes. We've talked about our own personality with Erica. We've been doing those Enneagram personality types to just look and see like what, you know, what we're made of and how that, that how relationships work. Um, we've, I, I really can't think of other topics right now. We've talked about stress and how to manage stress. Anyway, all of this sort sort of is like combined in the series, better building better relationships and Mary Lauren Doggett, Actually, you're, I could just called you your whole name. Why did I do hey, that? It happens. <laughs> That's so funny. I guess it's because I just met you. I just have to say Mary Lauren Doggett, all of it. Well, my husband's name is Clay and everybody calls him, hey, there's Clay Doggett. So Clay maybe Doggett. it's a Doggett thing. Everybody calls you by your full name. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so now we're going to talk about palliative care in general. I want some information about that. But then also we're going to kind of like transition into how is this information helpful for us as Christians and in our churches? So that's kind of where we're going for today. Let me yes. check the comments real quick. And just so that you know, that's what I'll do. Often that's yeah. probably going to be like um, when I have a new co-host on here, especially someone who has a wealth of information in their specific field, I don't have quite as much to offer. I do make sure to keep up with the comments, though. Sounds um, great. I see learn. a comment already. That's great. I can't wait to get to that one. Yeah. And so I want to go ahead and get to these um, before we ever even get started. Paige says, my first dog came from Lawrence County. That's kind of cool. We love dogs here, as you yes, guys know. Yes, me too. Most of the time, my dogs make really loud interruptions during this podcast. So um, Paige says that she's praying for the doctor's health and her health journey. She said, I prefer to think of it as palliative and supportive care because it shouldn't just be end of life. Palliative should be consulted as soon as a chronic diagnosis is made to help with goals and building relationships between patient, family, and palliative team. Right. And so I think, Paige, can you let me know if I'm not mistaken, you're in the same field. Let me know if that's true. So anyway, like, what do you have to say about that? I want her to join my marketing team. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's perfect. And I um, I specifically deal in the in the end of life realm because I'm with a hospice and palliative care program. But you are exactly right. I beg my specialists as soon as you hit that diagnosis of CHF or COPD, Palliative is symptom management. It does not have to be an end of life. Um, technically, all of nursing care, health care, a huge part of what we do is symptom management, no matter what the diagnosis is, terminal or not. Um, so you're exactly right. Palliative, palliation of, of symptoms is what we do. And I love that you made that distinction. Yeah, yeah, that's really good. So I guess we can just start there. Can you talk more about like maybe what you included in the blog post and kind of give us some better understanding of the distinctions. Yeah. So <clears throat> most of the time when I get um, referred to a patient and I go visit them and their family, what in my realm of palliative, I, I do um, home-based palliative care. So I, I go to the patient's homes, wherever that may be. Um, and the first question I ask them is, tell me what you understand about palliative care, because nine times out of 10, it's nothing. Tell me what you do. Um, so, <clears throat> oh, Paige just said she's in pediatric critical care. I love that. I'm, you're, you're a special person because that's not yeah. my comfort yeah. zone at all. Yeah. Um, but I tell them a lot of people are afraid of a palliative care consult because they think that that means my doctor thinks I'm dying. And that may be true. You know, it, it very well could be a terminal diagnosis. It may be just a chronic condition. Um, that could lead to their death eventually. But with palliative care, our focus is improving quality of life all the way around. So physically, we want you to feel better. Emotionally, we want you to have that mental health aspect um, of processing the diagnosis, of processing what this means your life is gonna look like from now on. Um, in my specific world, that means um, death. How do they process death? What does that look like for them? Um, what preparations have they made, if any? Um, a big part of what I do is what's called goals of care discussions that are hard discussions, but just like Paige was talking about, the earlier you engage them in these conversations, 
the more comfortable and more peace they're going to have with it later on. The last thing that you want someone to do is to be deciding whether they want CPR or not for their family when they don't have a heartbeat anymore, because that's the situation where you're, it's an emergency. I have to decide, did, did mom or not? Did they want to have CPR or not? We want to have that conversation way early so that mom and dad can tell us what they want. And if they don't know, I help them walk through what that looks like. So it's a very multifaceted discipline because it's much more than just physical symptoms. It's much more than just dealing with the patient's symptoms. We are very engaged in caregivers and family. Um, What I love about palliative care, probably from the get-go that I saw was a difference in what I did as a family nurse practitioner in the clinic setting was I get to see the patient in their home environment surrounded by their primary caregivers, if they have any, sometimes they don't. Um, And I get to kind of see the real them. Um, A lot of times the patients kind of protect their caregivers from what's going on. You know, they're the ones with cancer or they're the ones with CHF or or whatever. Yeah. But their tendency is to say, you know, I'm okay if the daughter's around or the, the spouse is around. When I come, they know my job is to find out what their actual symptoms are and they just tell me like it is you know they they have that permission to be themselves and they have that permission to say I don't have to be strong for her that's what she's here for is to help me feel better if possible Mm -hmm. you know so it's a it's much more than just the medicine side of things that's probably what drew me to this you know as much as anything I think that whenever I was reading the blog that's what it probably kind of like stuck out to me you know the other thing that stuck out to me was that you said that oftentimes before they reach you they have not ever been told what their diagnosis is whether it's terminal or not yes I found that very interesting because I do think that well I know uh I know in my training as a counselor one of the things that I run that stuck out to me in my training was to be sure that um that you say things in such a way that's, that's kind and caring, but also truthful and honest. And I, I think that, um, I don't know if I'm assuming like doctors know how to say, you know, this is a terminal situation, but they avoid it because it's hard. I don't know. So I don't know. Like, what are your thoughts about that? Like having that's a hundred percent. Right. And I think there's a lot of factors that go into the reasons why that's not talked about or, and that's another thing Dr. Lip wants to address in um, the blog is there's very little training on those conversations, the hard conversations in medical school. Um, She said she had, she remembered one course. It was Mm -hmm. a one day. It wasn't even a course. It was a one day. Here's how to have a palliative care. I mean, a end of life uh, conversation your assignment is tell this patient they have stage four cancer go and she said the interesting thing was they recorded it it was on video so she still has it and she said she went back and watched it not too long ago and she said it was terrible I mean it was terrible (laughs) Um, but she learned a lot from it and so there are many times when I get a referral for instance a, a patient with congestive heart failure most of my patients are geriatric um I do have some younger patients um with cancer and things like that but One that comes out pretty often is I have patients who have COPD and CHF. They'll get a referral to me because they've started having more severe symptoms, but they've had the diagnosis for 5, 10, 15 years. They've known they've had it, but no one has ever said to them, this is not curable and you will eventually die from this if you don't die from something else first. Um, And so when, you know, when I say, okay, it looks like you were referred to me for CHF or COPD. They're like, yeah, yeah, I've had that forever and I can't I can't breathe real well. So I start digging into that. And a lot of times they don't understand that the reason they can't breathe well is because their organs are slowly failing. Uh You know, it's a chronic debilitating thing. And when I tell, you know, when we start having the goals of care conversation, it's like a light bulb goes off a lot of times and they go through this whole I I see them go through the shock, even though they've had the technical diagnosis for years. No one has ever said I'm sorry, what, you you know, this is something that's going to end your life eventually. Yeah. And I think physicians are afraid to come out and say, this is going to lead to your death. And 
there's a because I think it's ingrained in the medical field. We're we're trying to preserve life. We're trying to make people live longer and live longer. And so they're afraid of this. If I tell them they're dying, I have failed. It, that's my personal oh. opinion is I think oh. there's that feeling of they feel like they're failing if they acknowledge that death is coming, even though that's completely irrational because they didn't cause the COPD or the CHF. I mean, and in my opinion, in that situation, they need a therapist to work through their own feelings. <laughs> yes. And I tell, yes. And I tell Dr. Lip and, and some of my colleagues all the time, we're not just nurse practitioners. We're very much therapists. We see in action, shock, denial, grief, anger. They go through all these grieving processes and a, a lot of times eventually acceptance. The sad thing is the later the palliative referral, the less likely they're gonna be able to work through the emotional side of that diagnosis. And so a big part of what I do is I tell everybody we're meeting them where they are. You know, yeah, right. sometimes they, patients are very, you know, um, proactive and they look up all the information um, diagnosis is terminal. Yeah. Sometimes they've never cracked a book about it and they have no idea. So, um, we have to meet them where they are. And sometimes that means I go see certain patients much more often because I have to feed them bits of information until they process that. And then we move to the next step. Um, that's not possible if I'm referred possibly a week or two before they die, you know, those, so that's why getting, I guess that's why getting palliative care out there is so important. Yeah, but I have so many questions. Like, All right, shoot. so many things that I that I want to say. Um, before I get to that, let me go ahead and get Paige's um, comments. Oh, she said that she's in. I think I said that she's in pediatric critical care. Um, in thinking about maximizing quality of life, however the individual defines that, we should think more about adding more elements of palliative care to primary care throughout the lifespan. The lifespan i.e. I might not want a routine screening test because if it finds something, I don't want to endure the treatment side effects. Um, and then she mentions the D word. We were talking about death just now, which we're going to be for the rest of this podcast episode. Yes. <laughs> what we are talking about. Paige says we, we need to think about our Christian perspective too. The Bible talks about the guarantee of death. So as Christian healthcare providers, we can bring that comfort, peace, and fact with us to our care. That's a very interesting um, subject matter that I feel like we've we're that's where we're going to be going in this podcast episode. Um, which I guess, like, I want to start there before I get to the Sue's comment. Um, here's my first question: So when you have to be the one to have that honest conversation. For me, I hear that you're developing, you're going to have to be developing listening skills, observational skills. You talked about paying attention to the way that they, like, like the light dawns on them. Or the, the, I don't think I just said that right, but you guys know what I mean. Yeah, um, light flicks on. The light flicks on and they're just, while you're speaking to them and then that, that in turn, you've got to be able to process their nonverbal communication. How much can they hear of this? When do I need to respect that they need time to process this before I put on more? Um, so that's like a real learning experience to be able to do that. And yeah. so this might be kind of like a too broad of a question, but when you have to have that honesty, um, like, I guess like all of that stuff I just said involved in this, what is your approach? You said that you do take these um, patients um, and meet them where they are. How do you yeah. determine that? How do you determine like where they are? So I don't make any assumptions. I don't assume that they even understand how the heart functions. I don't understand. I don't assume anything. So my first thing I do is ask questions. So my very, usually my very first thing is, okay, tell me what you understand about this recent diagnosis of cancer. What has your doctor told you? Because I don't want to assume he has said this is terminal because some, sometimes they don't. So yeah. um, th my first thing is ask questions. Mm -hmm. Once I kind of determine what they do actually know and if they have understood correctly, because most of the time I have, um, you know, consultation notes from the referring provider. So I, I can see the diagnosis and I review those before I go in. Mm -hmm. um, and I, it's very critical to make sure I understand the diagnosis because I don't want to go in and tell somebody, you know, I, I sometimes see five or six patients a day. So it would be 
horrific for me to go in and say, hey, Mr. So-and-so, you have stage four cancer when that was my last patient and not that one. Oh, <laughs> So wow. I have yeah. to make sure my ducks are in a row before I go in there. Once I kind of establish where they are, then I just kind of lay out for them gently, but, and I always preface it with, okay, so here's what you've told me you understand. Let me share with you, with your permission, because I always ask, mm -hmm. do you, are you, would you like to know more? Because I have more information. More than one time I've been told no. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. So sometimes patients w just say, um, he's told me what I need to know. And so we just kind of go on. And from that point, I don't tell them anymore. We just dive mm -hmm. into what symptoms they're having and we address those because next time um, I have built a little bit more rapport and chances are they've developed more symptoms and they need mm -hmm. to know why. So I meet them where they are. If they do want to know more after I've gotten their permission to tell them more, I'll just say, I've read your notes and it looks like your cancer has spread to your liver, which means that you are a stage four whatever cancer, um, your prognosis is unknown because every person is different. But in my experience, that is very advanced cancer. And yeah. if I have it in the notes that the doctor has said they're terminal, because there are some treatments for certain stages of cancer, mm -hmm. um, I will say on there, and there are, there are notes from your specialist saying that there are no curative treatments anymore. Usually after I've kind of dropped that, I don't say anything else for a minute. Mm -hmm. I just let it sit. I just kind of watch the patient. A lot of times family members are in there and everybody's looking at the patient. <laughs> no waiting for the patient. Yeah, everybody's patient. just like, what, what's the, yeah. and I'll, I'll, the patient knows, they mm -hmm. know. So even though nobody's said it to them, they're like, yep, I figured that, you know? And so everybody's waiting for this big, and sometimes there is a big reaction, um, but a, a lot of times in my experience, the patient knows their body, and even if they're scared to death, they're they're usually not completely shocked by it. Um, there, I have certainly seen times when they are utterly shocked, and a lot of times those are patients who were referred early on, and they don't have many symptoms yet, mm -hmm. um, so they still feel well enough, and if they've got some kind of big diagnosis there that's hard to process because there's not a tangible symptom to tag along with it so wow. I would say delivering that is finding out where they are by asking questions kindly but in as short and simple as I can yeah. deliver that there after I let it sit for a minute and they kind of process it questions come later mm -hmm. but that's a big you know a lot of times I'm like okay so there's just kind of this everybody in the room. And then it's almost it's interesting because it's almost a sense of big relief in the room. Like mm -hmm. finally, somebody said it out loud. Finally, we have an answer to what's been going on. Um, I've seen a lot of different, you know, some people are angry. I've had people get up and leave the room. I've had um, I had one guy say, I think you need to leave now. Um, so mm -hmm. I, I left, you know, I always respect their wishes. Um, I ended up going back and he ended up being a, just a precious, I, I developed a really good relationship with him and he ended up going to hospice, but he was referred pretty early on. Mm -hmm. And um, so anyway, That's, I don't know if that answers the question or not. But. It totally answers the question. And I'm so, um, I have even more questions. <laughs> All right, good. <laughs> um, let's go ahead and get to Sue's comment. She says in Erica's, um, Sue says, I was diagnosed almost four years ago with med, I always have trouble saying that word. Metastatic. Metastatic breast cancer with metastasis to the bone. I have taken some medications. You might need to read this one because I don't understand the words. <laughs> okay. Um, so far, it is staying put, not growing or moved to other places, but I do have side effects that I deal with daily. It would be great to have someone to talk to since to sometimes since my husband died last year after being in the hospital for two weeks and then at home with hospice for two days. Wow. Wow. Um, so I'm thankful for you for putting this in the comment section because it does raise up a, a question that I'd like to ask right now for you, Mary Lauren. Um, I don't know where Sue is, but what can you give some kind of like general understanding of how people can like reach out to someone who might need palliative care how would she yeah do that? absolutely so Sue first of all 
I cannot even imagine what all you have been through personally. I mean, you, I can't imagine. Th those are some huge, uh, you got the big C word diagnosis, then you went through that. Looks like a very swift transition with your husband. I'm so sorry you went through oh, all that. very quickly. It yeah. Um, and you are absolutely a prime candidate for palliative care because you qualify because of your diagnosis. Um, but it sounds like you're doing well. You know, it sounds like it's stable. Um, my first um, advice would be talk to your primary care doctor because palliative care is not um, readily available everywhere in the country. Um, mm -hmm. And I don't know where you are, but there it is established in most places. And even if there's not a palliative care program that does home-based palliative care near you, there's probably one that would do telemedicine and telehealth with you. Um, but I would start with your primary care. We get a lot of referrals from oncologists. So if you're still seeing your oncologist routinely, that would be my second place to go. Um, just tell them, hey, I've learned about this palliative care. I think it would be great even if I don't have many symptoms right now. Um, just the emotional and the goal setting side of things mm -hmm. would be great um, to have. So that, that would be the two. And then you can, you can self-refer to palliative care um, depending on where you are. You just you can literally Google palliative care programs in your area. And most of them accept self-referrals. Wow. That's really good. Um, yeah. It seems like if I put myself in her place, it seems like it would be extremely helpful to have that advocate for me or someone to like go over my medical paperwork with me if I didn't understand something, I would be yes. able to talk more than just like an in and out doctor's visit about like the symptoms that I'm having from the medication or if there is any. Um, so I think that is a great resource and we all need that support. Um, t I mean, just to live life. So yeah, I, I think that that's really good. It um, hurts my heart that you didn't have that while you were going through what was happening with your husband also. Right. Yeah. Because it would have been there would have been symptom management there for you with the breast cancer, but you would have had the emotional support. A lot of what I do is what we call collaboration of care, mm -hmm. um, where had you, and I don't know if this was something that came up with you, but for instance, I've had patients in the past who are going through chronic illness that have a spouse pass away or something. And the one that's coming to my mind is I had a lady who's, um, I think it was a first cousin or something that passed away that she was really close to. She was supposed to have chemotherapy that week. She was overwhelmed with everything going on. So she called me to see if I could help. I was able to call the oncology office, say, hey, she needs to reschedule for this reason. Give me an appointment that I can follow up with her. I took care of all of that for her. Um, that was just one less thing she had to deal with while she yeah. was going through all the, you know, so it was. I, I told her I was her personal assistant for a few days. And yeah. I think it's helpful to have somebody in the medical field that can help you with that, you yeah. know, even though it wasn't technically your illness at the time, you you had a lot on your plate. And so you could have had somebody in your corner for that. Yeah, exactly. She said, this is the fourth time with, with a cancer diagnosis going back to 1989. But again, I have been so blessed. You've been through a I lot. Did, that's a very um, encouraging attitude for me, um, uh, Sue. So I hope and you're a strong lady, I can see. <laughs> <laughs> you're very resilient and tough and encouraging. So Sue, if you have any other questions about that or any um, help that you need regarding that, let us know. And you can also send me an email at be a mindful soul at gmail.com. If you have any more specific questions or concerns there, and if it's something that I can get in touch with Mary Lauren for you, then that's fine. As far as like just general questions, we can try to answer those for you. Erica says, it's hard to explain from the receiving end what a blessing palliative and end of life care is for all members of the family. My mother-in-law was diagnosed and passed in 16 days and the palliative hospice team basically cared for my children while we were, while we just sort of fell apart. It was such a blessing for someone to play games. Oh, it moved. Sorry. Um, and distract my babies so that they don't have the memories of memories of their daughters, of their family being so distraught. That's interesting. So have you ever been in a situation like that where you sort of played with the kids for a minute while the caretakers and the patient sort of interacted together? Yeah, I'll try to tell this one without crying, but um, <clears throat> I have a patient that comes immediately to mind. He lives in a small town close to where we live, and he was the primary caregiver for his grandson. He has a child, a son 
that is addicted to drugs and lost custody of the grant of the child. So he became the patient, my patient's um, child. You know, he, he got sole custody of him when he was like two or three. When I got the referral for this patient, he had advanced lung cancer, um, stage four, um, mets to the bone. And there was not another option for this grandchild, another, um, you know, really to go anywhere. Um, oh, wow. My primary role in that situation was to help find, my patient's goal was to find a safe place for his grandson to die, to go when he died. Mm -hmm. um, and this little boy looked like my oldest child. I immediately want, you know, I, I told my husband, I said, if I come home with another little boy, mind your business, because, <laughs> you know, I'm just bringing him home with me. So mm -hmm. a lot of, he was the grant, my patient was not going to find peace until he knew that his grandson was going to be taken care of in his absence. So my mission from that day forward was to figure out, you know, so I, we, I got in touch with local social work and child protective services. We actually found an aunt um, that was in a good situation um, that agreed to come in with me the day that I was talking to, to the patient about this. And she, you know, she told him, we're going to take care of him. You're going to, it's okay. He's got a place to go. Wow. You do what you need to do. He died in two days. Wow. Um, wow. Yeah. So, and that's, that sweet grandson I stood out in the yard with him while the aunt and you know and and the grandfather had that discussion because he was mentally with it enough that you know he he had things he wanted to say to her about you know he, he told him I wanted him to know what his favorite foods were and you know all the all the things that you hope somebody else knows so well yeah like I gotta just take a moment <laughs> <laughs> I know right yeah that's good that's good. yeah it's that's what we are called to do as Christians. Yeah. Yeah. I have to actually take another breath. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I actually, I remember um, it was, it, that was a late referral again. Um, he was not a, and in the oncologist defense, this was an unknown. Um, mm -hmm. So it was a referral that was like, oh no, we got to get on this right now. And I remember calling that, that child's principal, I called teachers and I said, Hey, this is what's going on. If he's off at school, this is why, um, wow. you know, so it was very much, I was his nurse practitioner as much I was, as I was the patients. So. I think that was going to be my question there too. I was thinking like, how many patients do you serve at one time? Because it seems pretty involved. And I know one of the things that your blog post, um, your blog article mentioned was, the reason for the need for palliative care is because doctors and nurse, nurses in the in the clinics and in the hospitals are quite overwhelmed and they just have to stay on their rounds. And there's not like the personal, you didn't say it this way, but there, there's not that personal interaction all the time, yeah. that personal connection. And so that's kind of like where you kind of stand in the gap there. I'd even written that word, you know, standing in the gap there yeah. on our paper. Um <laughs> I think I just went around the blog now. I can't remember my question. My question is how many clients or patients do you actually have on a regular basis? My census right now, I have 93 patients. Um, how do you manage to do these things that are like what you did for this man? Because that's, you, you can say it real easy. I got on the phone. I called department of human services. I did this, I did that, but that takes a lot of time and effort yeah, it does. Um, and we're actually, this is a plug for any palliative care nurse practitioners in Southern Middle Tennessee. We're looking to hire another one. <laughs> um, so that's part of it. But the good thing is most of my patients I see on a monthly basis. So okay. I usually see five to six patients per day, um, okay. which is coming from a busy clinic where I used to work. I would see 30 to 40 patients a day. So when I changed jobs, I was like five patients a day. This is going to be easy until I got in and saw what all I needed to do with each patient. Plus there's driving right. time. But in general, unless they're really, really sick, I see most of my patients once a month um, because most of mine are already going to specialists pretty often. They've still got their primary care. A lot of them also have home health nurses come in. So it's not like they're without a, a sole provider. I'm just an added specialist in their life. Um, but I'm also kind of like, um, I don't know, an ex I guess I'm more involved in the personal things. So yeah. Um, as patients become sicker and more complicated, I, my visits become more frequent typically. And this is going to sound 
bad, but it's the nature of what I do. My patients pass away pretty often. So, you know, they transition to hospice care um, and it's, it's almost a rotating door. You know, I'll have this group of patients that I have for quite a while. And that's another challenge that I probably would um, warrant a whole nother hours podcast. But yeah. one thing I've had to learn is, you know, these people become like family most of the time. I get really attached mm-hmm. to them knowing the whole time they're going to die. Yeah. So it's, it's this big emotional, and I, I don't understand how um, people who are not Christians handle things like this me Um, too me too I just you know I I just can't fathom it that's like that's a whole nother thing but (laughs) to get back to the original thing there's quite a bit of transition between my census so Mm -hmm. I may have 90 something patients but a quarter of them won't even be with us anymore in two or three months from now so it's you know I'll we constantly get new referrals but I think the 93 really like through, I thought you were going to say like way less than that only because of the, all the things that you do and because I know what it's like to have a heavy caseload in the mental health world, you know, and we're doing similar things yet. We're not have, I mean, sometimes we're having to deal with um, terminal illnesses in families. Sometimes I've had to deal with that in, but but I'm not having to deal with it quite so much as you are. I mean, that's what you do. Right. Um, yeah. So, I mean, like, I just know, like I've had like anywhere from, I mean, I think like upwards of 70 or 65 clients and some of these people need to be seen multiple times a week yeah. and to be that's able to manage that is extremely difficult given the fact that most of my clients that I worked with were like low functioning and needed a great deal of support just to do like normal tasks on a daily basis, you know? Yeah. Um, And I'm sure you kind of have like some of that in a line of work that you do too, where you've got like caretakers that aren't extremely functioning well. Yeah. um, And having to like explain these very complicated matter matters in simple terms can get very difficult. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean like 93, I just kind of like, Oh man, yeah. how do you do all that? <laughs> well, I definitely do not do it alone. That's for yeah. sure. I have an awesome office staff. Um, we have palliative care coordinators that help with scheduling. I have a nurse named Brian that works with us. And there are, day, there are certainly days when I have a full schedule that somebody will call and say, hey, we need somebody to see them now. I think it's time mm-hmm. to transition to hospice. And I may be two counties over. So yeah. I'll call Brian. I call him my Superman. I'll say, hey, I need you to go to this patient right now and see what's going on. Um, yeah. So it's definitely a team effort and, and our, our team is the best and I'm a hundred percent biased in saying that, (laughs) but, but you know, you know what you're working with. I want to catch some of these comments real quick. Let's see. Okay. Okay. Erica, Sue, let's see. I was actually at the Cantor treatment center of America with my daughter when my son called me and told me that his dad had passed. Um, Vicky says, um, I don't mean to jump over that comment. I'm sorry, Sue. I just kind of was like going through them. Um, that's kind of sad too, to think that you were probably, I don't know where you're located, but evidently you weren't there. And so that makes another difficulty in that situation. You'll never forget where you were when you got that call, I bet. Right, right. Vicky says, my mom was placed in palliative care and she was not responded to COVID treatment or rehab. She deteriorated rapidly when I took her home and went into hospice care and passed away within a week. Unfortunately, we saw a lot of that with COVID. Yeah. Well, and I guess you were on the front lines of some of that. So you know what that looks like, especially like right there at the beginning. Yeah. It was hard. Um Sue says, thank you so much for all that you do. I think she's talking about you. <laughs> um, so and, let's she do says, it. and she says, amen, I can handle this because I have God on my side. That's That goes back to what you were saying. Sometimes I think about that too, like in my line of work, how do these people cope without God? You know, how do they do those things? I'll just tell you, there are times I feel, and Erica we attend the same congregation at Fairview and there have been so many times when I've had fam- patients who don't have anybody, they don't have family, they don't have neighbors, they have nobody. And I'll call my church family and I'll say, look, 
I've got a need for this. I can't tell you who it is, but can you get me this, this, or this, or can you provide transportation, um, you know, to a, a doctor's visit? Are you, you know, our church family, our, God's people show up. Yeah. And that's, that's something amazing. that I, I'm telling you what, I just have a new, I tell everybody this job makes me a better Christian mm -hmm. for a million reasons. I think we're going to get into that here in a little bit, yes. but um God's family takes care of everyone. And that's how we let our light shine. I'm just, you know, part of what I do too is spiritual, um, you know, end of life cannot be addressed without addressing spiritual right. condition. Mm -hmm. And not all my, most of my patients are not members of the church, but mm -hmm. I'm given an opportunity to shine my light for them at a time when they are searching for God. Yeah. And, you know, I can, I may not can have a, a formal Bible study with them in that moment because I'm there mm -hmm. as their palliative nurse practitioner. Mm -hmm. But if they ask me, you know, how do I cope with this? Or if they're religious and they say, what's your favorite Bible verse? Or would you pray with me? I have the opportunity to do that, you know, yeah. and it's a unique because in a hospital setting, that's not always possible. There are restrictions and rules and all mm -hmm. these things. Um, and in palliative care and, and hospice care, when a patient is, you know, searching for something and they specifically ask, what do you do? You believe in God? Mm -hmm. I get to have that conversation. Yeah. And if they say, why do you believe in God? I get to tell them and they don't have to agree with me, but they're asking me and I get to I get to talk to them about that. And I've had some really good. My favorite things are when I get to take care of members of the church who are faithful Christians. And oh, I've, yeah. I've had the, the privilege of doing that a few times. And so what does that look like? What are the, can you see the difference? Peace that passes understanding is a palpable thing. Yeah. And when I've taken care of, sorry, I'm going to need a minute. <laughs> <laughs> while you're, um, while you're taking a breath. Um, I hope that our audience and our listeners can see just how relative this conversation is as for Christians. Yeah. So I, it's, it's this weird thing. A lot of times when I meet another member of the church and I'm having that big conversation where I have to say, do you know you're dying? Basically, if they're a faithful Christian, it's a much different conversation than somebody who's not sure if they believe in God. Mm -hmm. or agnostics yeah at the end of life they're wondering they're always questioning it if you're a faithful member of, of the lord's body there's no question you may be sad about who you're leaving you may be sad about things you wish you had done or or you know there's there's always something that we're going to regret big or small but if you're a faithful member of the church you're looking forward to what's coming and there's and not different. that there's not that hole there that you're having to figure out how to feel. And, you know, no. I imagine that there's some sort of like panic or something going on in the person that, that isn't faithful or that hasn't put on Christ, you know, and that, that hasn't gotten their religion or their spirituality straightened out. Yes. I know like there, in my line of oh, work, ahead. I was going to say like, I know in my line of work, sometimes people ask me like, how do you incorporate your, Christian worldview. Now it's very easy for me to do now because I only really work with members of the church and just word of mouth referral. Yeah. Someone's needing a little bit of help through a specific problem. Um, but before, like when we were in the States and I was working full time with, with mental health, it was sort of the same thing. If they brought it up, Look, scientifically speaking, spirituality is extremely important. You can you can ignore it all you want to, but when it comes down to it, your mental health, your spiritual health, your physical health, all of those things work together. You know, yeah. and so like if I'm sitting in front of a client that doesn't have any type of spirituality, I'm going to question that because from and they're going to have symptoms. They're going to have physical gonna, symptoms from that. They're going to have physical symptoms. They're going to have mental symptoms. And I can recognize the mental symptoms very easily. Immediately. That's what I work with. Yep. You know, and so my there's a term in end of life um, called terminal agitation. It's a medical I term. I think I've heard that before. It's horrible. It's end of life. It's a patient who is no longer conscious, basically, but they're what we call terminally agitated. They are, it is a soul who is struggling. Yeah. I've never. This has probably happened to a faithful Christian. I'm, I'm sure that there have, 
have been maybe, you know, someone who's being tormented by something um, Mm -hmm. at end of life. I've seen it most often in patients who are spiritually unsettled and they, there are medications that have not, that, that cannot touch this. Um, They cannot be sedated. They cannot be calmed. It's horrible. And sometimes it lasts until death. Sometimes it's um, a few days of something, you know, you have those stories that people say we, she didn't wake up. She didn't talk. She didn't do anything. But when her son from Texas came in, she opened her eyes and smiled and then she died. Wow. Those are things you can't explain, but they happen. And so it's the same with if you're spiritually unsettled and you're not sure about where you're going, your body may be checking out, but your mind and spirit are still there. And I do my best at end of life to help people find peace. It's very difficult when a person is, when I know somebody is not a faithful Christian and they think they have mm-hmm. peace. That's hard. I, I have a hard time um, coping with that. That's, yeah, that's probably the hardest ones. Um, I'm having like a little bit of trouble with my internet connection. It says that it's unstable. I don't know why. Maybe it's the weather. But I'm just letting everybody know. Please stick around, if it, even if it's choppy. Um, so, and I, that's one thing I'm still processing. My best answer to that so far is Jesus didn't convert everybody either. Um, yeah. and so, but that doesn't mean we stop trying. We, we have to keep being a light. A lo- another thing I struggled a lot with was when patients ask me to pray for them. Sometimes they're male. Um, sometimes they're female. If they're not members of the church, I don't have any trouble praying with them or for them. Um, yeah. if, if there's somebody that I know is a member of the church present, that's a male, I always ask them to do it. Mm-hmm. Um, but when I pray for someone or with someone who is not a Christian, I always pray that God brings them relief from their physical suffering. And I also always pray that he gives us a heart to seek him and to seek his righteousness. And I always pray that he continues to give us um, a hunger and thirst for righteousness, righteousness, because my personal prayer in that moment is that they find physical, I mean, spiritual salvation before they don't have any life left in in them. And sometimes just hearing that prayer will lead to a Bible study. And sometimes it doesn't, but, Mm -hmm. you know, are you usually the one who will do the Bible study? Like you'll come back in your own free time to do it. Or will you try to get like others in the church involved to say, I usually try to get others in the church involved. I poor Brandon, Erica's husband. Yeah. <laughs> He's my go-to. He, he never minds doing it. He always yeah. loves to help where he can. There's a specific patient that I patient, um, and we actually, her grandkids always come to VBS and things like that, but she's not a member of the church, but she's struggling spiritually and emotionally. She's got a, a pretty advanced diagnosis also. So mm-hmm. when she became my patient, I asked her if she was okay with Brandon coming to study with her <laughs> and Brandon was like, I'd be happy to. So he, he had, I have been able to do that through him. Um, yeah. so, and that's another example of our church shows up, you know, mm-hmm. our church family mm-hmm. shows up. So why don't we go ahead and get into that? And I'm not ignoring the comments. I'm going to get to these because they're very important. I see some that I want to get to. Um, But I was writing some things down while you were talking earlier. Uh, Wait just a second. Hang on. Let's see. Yeah. Um, But I want to go back first to the quote that you put in your blog article by Cicely Saunders. Is this a nurse? She was a nurse, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, She was a nurse, and here's the quote. The care of the dying demands that we can do. Wait, let me back up here. Yeah. The care of the dying demands all that we can do to enable patients to live until they die. I looked at that from, like, the spiritual standpoint. And while you were talking, I just kind of wrote down some stuff about, like, how you meet these patients where they are. And it's something that I can connect with very well because I have to do the same thing in mental health, right? I yeah. do a lot of the same things that you do. I don't know um, that they know. I ask a lot of questions to understand. There's um, a very, Im- there's a huge emphasis on building rapport and um, making sure that I'm empathetic and growing my own empathy. You know, that's not something that some people naturally have loads and loads of empathy. Other people need to develop that more. And my, right. my internet is stable. So I'm wondering. You're if good I'm still. Feel good. Yep. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, unstable, not stable. 
Um, <laughs> and then, you know, working on boundaries, you had, you didn't say the word boundaries, but one of the things that you mentioned was somebody asked you to leave and you said, okay, and you left, you know, so you didn't take that personally. You just said they need time and then you moved yeah. on. Um, I'm thinking like all of these things that I'm saying, this is like a really long way around the question um, or the statement um, that all fits into how we should be interacting and building relationships with our fellow brothers and sisters. And then with those in evangelism type atmosphere, just like with anybody that we come into contact with, it takes yeah. all of these things. And I think, I've, I think like, I don't know if this is true, but I feel like in our, um, in our modern society with all of this, this internet access and ways that we can do stuff like in tele world and even what we're doing now, there's a certain um, missing component to that personal connection. Not that this is a bad thing. This We're right. getting a connection here, but like. Um, I can't I reach out and touch you on the shoulder right now. Right, right. And so there's a little bit of like, we can't interact with our nervous systems really aren't fully interacting with each other. Like I think God expects. Yeah. You know, he, he created us to be connected, you know? Um, so I guess like with all of that being said, all of that stuff translates into our Christianity and it goes back to that quote. And I'm going to read it again. The care of the dying demands all that we can do to enable patients to live until they die. And so I kind of want your insight into how, um, your experience as a palliative care nurse practitioner has um, provided you a, a better quality relationship with those around you and has helped you as a Christian. Yeah. You don't have enough time for me to, <laughs> to tell you all the ways that it's made me a better person and Christian. Um, I've got a long way to go, but it's actually, it's at least given me a, a an insight. I think that quote in the medical field what that literally means or what it was meant to mean is a patient is not dead until they take that last breath. Mm -hmm. Sometimes people feel like the day of the diagnosis is the day they started dying. Um, Ooh, yeah. You're not dead until you've taken your last breath. Mm -hmm. And so our job in palliative care is to help you live your life. However much time is left to the fullest. Mm -hmm. So in Christianity, palliative care has helped me to see I'm not dead until I take my last breath. One of the patients that I cared for was a very faithful Christian who evangelized until the day she died. Yeah. Despite yeah. anything going on with her, she was hooked up to a chemo IV drip and she was evangelizing to the nurses that were in the room with her. Her wow. diagnosis. It's kind of. Oh, it broke up oh, just a little you bit. I, yeah. You said her diagnosis and I did think not stop her. Oh, yeah. She she lived her life spiritually, physically to the fullest until she was gone. And for me, it's a it's a very stark reminder that at any point in time, I could be the one getting the diagnosis. Mm -hmm. My husband could be the one. My child could be the one. It could be that I walk out in front of a bus by accident tomorrow. It doesn't have to be cancer. Life is fleeting. It's a vapor. We read that in the Bible. It's so true. And so I think that working in end of life and hospice and palliative care ironically makes you live better. Mm -hmm. um, and so in the world of Christianity, like you were talking about with empathy, I didn't know what empathy was until I started working in palliative care. And the reason I say that is because I get a back backdoor view, I guess, of what's really going on with people. You know, you hear, um, you never know what's going on with somebody. Yeah. I do now. Right. I do know what's going on with a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And so every person that I see that has road rage, I yeah. think in my mind, oh, they may have just found out their daddy's got cancer. Right. Or the person who is rude to me at Walmart may be dealing with, you know, they're about to lose their house because they've had to pay for cancer treatments for however long. Yeah. So, to me, it's made me a better person because we're supposed to believe the good. You know, mm -hmm. we're supposed to assume all things are good. And I, I used to not do that. Um, I used to just be like, oh, well, that's not how I want to be. Well, I might be like that one day if I if I have a horrible day because I've just heard the worst thing I've heard yet. You know, so mm -hmm. as a Christian, I, I now do a better job of assuming the best about people instead of the worst. Um, 
I would say it's made me a better mama because almost every patient that I have seen on their deathbed, and this could be for weeks and months, you know, people die over different periods of time. People always talk about their childhood and their mamas and daddies. I don't care if they're 90 years old or if they're 37. Mm -hmm. Um, they, they remember what their childhood was like and they remember what their mama liked to do. And so, <clears throat> sorry, as a mom, <laughs> I think weird things now, like when my son is dying at 80 years old, what's he going to remember about his mom? Mm -hmm. So I think that the fruits of the spirit are applied differently. Um, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> When you're looking through that lens of life is fleeting and, you know, you're going to be more gentle. You're going to be more kind. It's, if you don't, um, it's just like Solomon said in Ecclesiastes, vanity of vanities, life is vanity. Your life is going to be empty without Christ. Right. I'm taking a breath too. So I'm <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I'm going to take some sweet tea. Yeah. Yeah. Get a drink. Get that energy. Um, but it's mm -hmm. when I guess when you're looking at life through the lens of brevity, you know, um, and through the lens of it could be a lot worse. Sometimes it's hard to breathe thinking about how blessed I am. Yeah. Um, well, so, gratitude and yeah ev everything is different and so even asking this question or even talking about this i think that um as christians i would say that we think about death is an actual part of our conversation regularly yeah. because the reason that we, I mean, it's, it's our spirituality. We're concerned with our eternal life. And so death is a real part of that. And it's yeah. a very honest part. And we are um, hopefully taking a look and saying, okay, this is how I want to make sure that, that I'm taken care of when I die, you know? Yeah. yeah. And so I kind of think that like every single bit of the things that you just said, um, we all need to consider as Christians while, some of us are in professions where it's kind of like slammed in our faces. It's very important to get in touch with that aspect of yeah. our spirituality because it can be very easy to forget that one day I might die. Yeah. And I think that, but I do think that as Christians, we, we are the ones on the planet that actually think about it. Yeah. You know? And um, you know, there's a term in palliative care and hospice care. We say that was a good death. You know, they they fulfilled, you know, they, they were able to check off what they wanted to do on their bucket list. They oh, wow. they resolved relationships that were, mm -hmm. you know, you know, I was able to reconcile with my brother. I was able to do, you know, whatever. And they died a peaceful death because it was a whole everything was in line. Their physical mm -hmm. pain was managed. Their spiritual pain was taken care of their emotion. So in in the Christian's life, you know, I we talk about death with our kids, right? It's not a morbid thing. We don't talk about it so much that they that's all they can focus on. But mm -hmm. when we have a faithful Christian pass away, it's a celebration for us. Right. You know, it's one of those things. Yay. They, they had a good death. This is a good, mm -hmm. they're, they're in paradise. Now we're, mm -hmm. if we're faithful, we get to see them again. And this is a good thing. And I think that's left out of our kids conversations too much. There's a big, you know, I think parents are uncomfortable to talk about death because the parent is uncomfortable with death. Right. Yeah. And, you know, it's, you can have, it is a beautiful, beautiful thing to have a peaceful death. And not all of us are going to be blessed with the knowledge that our death is coming soon. You know, I, I, as weird as that sounds, I think it's a blessing to have an idea of when the end of your life is going to be. Right. Some people would disagree, but I, I think that for a faithful Christian, if you, and you still don't know for sure, because you right. can die of something else first, right. but if you have a cancer diagnosis and they say you've got three to six months to live, 
I'm going to be that person, I hope, one day that for three to six months, I'm bringing every single person I can to Jesus in three mm -hmm. to six months. Mm -hmm. We should all be doing that all the time anyway. Right. You know, there's an urgency about there's something. It's almost like we only give ourselves permission to live like we're dying when we're dying. When we're actually dying. Right. We're all dying. But we are dying. <laughs> it's coming. Unless Jesus comes first, we're all going to die. That, and and so, that's how I kind of like saw her statement to the care of the dying. Okay. Yeah. So like as Christians, we understand that we're all dying. Yeah. Um, just some quicker than others and some more. Um, well, I just said that I, I was going to say the same thing again. I was going to yeah. say that but uh, the care of the dying demands all that we can do to enable patients to live until they die so it's that's just kind of like our responsibility as christians yeah and here's the <laughs> trick end of life medically is defined as the last three to six months of life can you tell me when your last three to six months of life are going to start no nope it could be today yeah so yeah. you know it's like the last three to six months of life is end of life for everyone. But when does that start? Nobody knows. So there's an urgency to starting today to work on that, you know. So I want to go, I want to catch these comments before we get off of here. And we are at our hour, but we're going to go a little over. Um, before I catch these comments, I'm going to take this time to say that in the future for the Mindful Soul podcast, we are going to try to keep it to an hour because what we we've never kept it kept it to an hour so it's not just you Mary Lauren. Okay. Um, but what I was um what I'm thinking of doing is kind of closing the podcast down and then opening a Zoom that's for members of Digital Bible Study. So if you're a member and you support Digital Bible Study as a member um then you'll be invited to come to like a Zoom session it's going to be sort of like ask the therapist, but not necessarily, not really. Whoever I have on here as a co-host, if they're able to spend the extra time with me, then they, I'm going to give them the opportunity to come into that Zoom as well so that you can ask questions um, face to face, you know, instead of just having to always write it in the chat. So please consider um, subscribing to Digital Bible Study and becoming a member and supporting that um, to supporting that organization because that's going to give you that extra benefit here at the Mindful Soul. And I'm Great really idea. looking forward to that. So I hope you guys are too. Um, so let's just get to the comments here. Lisa says, what do you do to care for yourself? <laughs> <laughs> well, simple things are I walk every day. I know that sounds mm -hmm. simple, but I get up every morning and I take a walk. That's the time I pray. Um, sometimes I just zone out and walk and sweat. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, but that, that clears my mind. I also have a professional therapist that I see once a month right now. Um, there are times particularly, and she wouldn't mind me telling this cause she knows it already right now. My overseeing physician, that's also my patient. Um, that's hard cause she's a friend. And yeah. so I, during this time of her illness, I'm probably going to see him a little more often. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, I have a professional therapist and then he's it's, my best friend. Oh, can you see me now? Well, okay. Yeah, there you go. Okay. Who's your so, best friend? Um, my husband is my best friend. So I unload on him quite often, but um, some days it's a, Hey, I had a rough day and I just need to sit here and mm -hmm. I don't tell him anything and we just sit there, but I, I, would, me, I would just, I'm hmm. oh, sorry. You go ahead. You go ahead. No, you're fine. I, I would just say, um, having a therapist has been great. Um, mm -hmm. and then also we do, um, debriefing in, um, cause there's other nurse practitioners in my group. There are times that we all have heavy things and we're like, guys, we need to debrief. So even yeah. if you don't do that in a professional setting, have you a group of people that you can debrief with and just say, look, this, this is TV drama episode number, whatever. Nobody's yeah. going to believe this happened to me today, but here's what happened to me today. <laughs> and you just tell your story. So, um, I and think then some days I don't deal very well. Sometimes you just have a, you have a breakdown and you move on. Yeah. I know like for, for me with the mental health therapy, I remember, um, I don't know, like, I don't, I don't know how I always process stuff, but I do know like the really heaviest ones. I almost tend to put in the back of my mind until later. Yeah. And then later I don't usually want to talk about it. I just yeah. need to sit in some quiet time. Yep. And that has made me, yes, 
it's made me realize the importance of solitude. So when you say that you take a walk every morning and sometimes you do nothing but walk, there is something that's very necessary about having moments of silence for yourself. Yeah. Where you just can be with your thoughts. And that's very difficult for some people to do, especially if they're very active and they have busy lives and everything. But it's extremely important to get that time, that alone time where you can just like sit with your thoughts and you yeah. can process through stuff. I'm reminded of probably like one of my biggest, um, I had, I've had a lot of difficult clients, but one of my clients, um, he was, seven at the time and he was left at school one afternoon but his mom was always there to pick him up and come to find out she had um she had been murdered during the day like while he was at school Hmm. and i had found out like later on that night they had called me and said hey he's he's left at school you know um but that was like such a nightmare having to deal with But, you know, at the time, like, you don't, I just don't think, like, it's very easy for me to talk about those things. You know, and then there's the privacy concerns and stuff, too, you know. Right. But but that aside, you can still say, like, I had a really tough day. Yeah. You know, but you just take it and you have that support system. You use it. You make sure you have solitude. And you give yourself space. If you don't feel like you can talk about it, just just sit with it. Yeah. You know? And so I think that those are all really good things. All I did was emphasize everything that you already did. So, hey, it's and, and everybody processes it in a different way. You know, you and I, solitude is different. It may be you sitting in a dark closet. Mine's walking up and down the driveway, yeah. but it's still solitude, you it's know, still solitude. Right. Um, And so let's see. Let's see. I want to go back here. Um, Paige says, that's why I can't do adult care. The idea of seeing a dead of a, of a dead patient spending eternity in hell is devastating. Dead children spend eternity with Christ and death truly ends their earthly suffering. That's one. Yeah. That's a, I understand that approach. Um, she said, have you ever seen any late in life conversions and baptisms? Well, I have, um, one was my great grandmother, actually. Wow. Um, that's not when I was working in palliative care, but she was 86 years old, I think, when she got baptized. Yeah. Um, so that was awesome. And then we had another lady that was a member of our church. Well, her, um, I guess it was her caregivers. They weren't related, but they went to church with us that Brandon actually baptized while she was in the nursing home um, in a, they had a, a bathtub that they filled up and baptized oh, wow. her. But as far as in my I have a couple Bible studies going that are actually not patients. They're um, co-workers of mine. So oh, pray wow. for that. Yes. Um, but yeah, I, I have not, I've been doing this for three years. And with what I've been able to do, I unfortunately have not seen any of my patients be baptized. But there are other members of the church that work in the company that I work for. And um, I know one of them got to be a part of a baptism with one oh. of their patients. So Wow, that's really cool. Yeah. yeah. Well, and it's uh, it's one of those things that you will, given the situ- given you stay in this field for a length of time, you're going to see it. You know, yeah, I hope so. Point. Yeah. Um, I have to figure out where I'm at on the list. That's why I look like that. Uh, <laughs> oh, Paige says the list you're going through, building rapport, listening, etc., are being missed in our congregations. I I do think that that is true in a lot of ways. The only other thing I can say about that is because I say that sometimes, or if I think that, that I'm like, well, what am I, I need to be doing. And I'm not indicting you page necessarily, yeah. but I'm saying I'm taking this personally and I'm saying, what can I do to make sure that I'm building those connections and um, listening to other, uh, to the members of my local congregation and what they have to say and that I'm checking on them and caring for their needs and in, in a way that I, that I'm able to, boundaries, understanding boundaries. That's like just missing in general. Yeah. <laughs> so like probably a whole, we need a several podcast episodes on just like how to handle boundaries. Yeah. And knowing when to stop asking questions, you yeah. know, there, sometimes somebody says, I have a lot going on at home. If they don't, you know, you don't have to say, Oh really what's going on? Just say, Oh, well, I'm going to pray about that for you. Yeah. You don't have to ask questions. Sometimes they want you to, but sometimes they don't want to talk about it. And, and right. knowing that, <laughs> I think sometimes asking questions is the wrong thing to do. Yeah. And I think that comes with experience when you're in a field like, like both of ours, you start to learn like 
different way, or different times. When when is it appropriate to be quiet? When is it appropriate yeah. to ask questions? You start to gauge like nonverbal communication and other things. I do think that fields like ours, the helping profession in general, like does build your empathy in some regard, you know, and that's something that we all should be working on is like how to like build up our empathy and develop that um, along with understanding our own boundaries, you know, and yeah. what we can and can't do. Like th that's like a, a completely different podcast episode <laughs> yeah uh, but you know what I was thinking I was thinking about like how so many of the things that we talked about today can be so useful in a bible study because yeah. when you're studying with someone who's not a member of the church don't you have to meet them where they are yeah don't you have to build rapport don't you have to set boundaries it's very um you, I don't know that you're going to have a successful Bible study if you're just like, yeah, sure, let's get together around, you know, yeah, we can do it one day this week. But when you set those boundaries and you say, I have my Bible, you have yours. I have my study book, you have yours. This is the, what we're going to cover. And it's going to be at Thursday at 3 p.m. You know, then they see that you're putting a great amount of effort into and seriousness into that Bible study. And those are the same qualities that you would use. Yeah. You know, um, so let's see. Let me go on here. Paige says, I think this also leads to hesitation and repentance and seeking help from brethren and overcoming sin and other struggles in life. She said that at 353. I have no idea what we were talking about then. <laughs> me either. I think I think that we were talking about I remember looking at that. Um, I think we were talking about um, not not acknowledging the brevity of life. You know, oh, if we okay. if we don't think about kind of be in a mindful state that my life is not forever, then it's going to lead to hesitating and repentance. I think, I think oh, I may be wrong. Correct me if I'm wrong, Paige. Yeah. That makes sense to connect those two. Yes, Douglas, very traumatizing information. Go back and listen to the rest of it. If you caught it late, but um, <laughs> you came in probably and we're like, what am I listening to? What, what am I listening to? Right. Um, and then Melissa says, thank you for all that you do. My mom has been living with Alzheimer's dementia for many years. She was assessed by palliative care over two years ago and referred to hospice care. She was on hospice for over two years they were such a blessing. We had a CNA three times a week plus nursing care. Unfortunately, Medicare refused to continue to pay for hospice care, but we are now on palliative care and we have home health. We have struggled with the lack of CNA care and so missed the love and it cut off the rest of that. I can't see the rest of it. Melissa, um, that is such a common problem. We see a lot of times because by Medicare standards, if a patient is stable for, you know, two years is a long time to be on hospice. So they they would like proof that the patient is truly nearing end of life. So it sounds like your mom is being very well taken care of and has been stable for a very long time and no longer meets the criteria for possibly death within the next three to six months. Yeah. So that doesn't mean that your needs are not still there. So it's really unfair, I, I feel like, mm -hmm. um, to remove that CNA because they are priceless. You are exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Paige says that she's praying for the Bible studies. Um, and, and you were right. You were able to, she said that. Okay, good. Right. I thought that's when it was. was. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. This was so great. I appreciate everybody here, all the comments and such a wonderful topic. We have had such a rich month full of great topics and we're going to continue having great topics on the show. So I hope you guys can tune in some more. But before we go, I want to give Mary Lauren a chance to just say anything. We probably missed a lot there. We could have another episode for sure. So I just want to give you like, what would you like to leave our listeners with today? Well, Paige just put a good question. Is palliative different from hospice? Yes. And I would refer you to the blog that I, I it, it really in detail talks about the difference, but in a nutshell, palliative care and hospice care, both care for patients who are terminal or potentially terminal, but with palliative care, they may have a longer life expectancy with hospice CMS as it has to be reasonable to assume they'll be reaching death within three to six months. Palliative care, we don't know their end of life, but we know that they have something that could end their life at some time. So our focus is symptom management primarily, um, but anyway, that the, the blog post goes into much more detail about that. And Paige, yes, they are different. That uh, the website I think is like listed at the top here before all of these comments, so you can go and click on that. Or if you're, I think you're um, following the Mindful Soul podcast, the page on Facebook. Uh, this morning I put the blog post there, and I think I may have even put it on my regular 
Facebook, whatever it's called, like feed thing. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So uh, I appreciate your time, Mary Lauren. Um, and I appreciate each and every person that comes into these podcasts and support us and support Digital Bible Study. I hope that you guys have a good Wednesday. And Paige says that she has your vote for another episode. So we're going to talk about that. And we'll see when we can get that set up. Um, if she's willing to come on maybe sometime in July, that would be great. Um, but I appreciate you guys. Hope you guys can make it to Bible class tonight and um, look forward to seeing you next week. Nice to meet you officially. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to end the broadcast now. Let's see.